you're one of those people who everyone has heard the work of, but they don't always think who's the guy behind that work. But going back to your early days, were you in garage bands or anything like that? Well, the, for the Jewish Journal folks, my career really began in the local Jewish community of Louisville, Kentucky, where yeah. I was born and raised. And might have been the same for you, Darren, but these were the folks who believed in me and gave me opportunities. Every Mizrahi and Hadassah and synagogue and congregational meeting, I was invited to perform. And that led to these same folks who got to know me and believed in my talent and my professionalism. They would hire me to do music for their events, bar mitzvahs, weddings, rehearsal dinners. So that's how I got in early start. And I was doing in you know, those kind of engagements, I was probably 10, 11 years old mm -hmm. in the Jewish community, because where else is a kid like that going to get real world experience? So to all of your readers <laughs> at the Jewish Journal, thank you, because it was folks just like you who encouraged me and gave me confidence to move forward in my career. Yeah, when I was in Louisville, do, do you, first of all, do you say Lowellville? Do you say, how do you say it? What's the right way? It depends to whom I'm speaking. <laughs> uh, you're in New York, so I will say I'm in Louisville, Kentucky. Okay, well, when I was in Louisville, Kentucky back in September, I had the pleasure of touring the JCC, and that was going to go in some coverage and all that. And it was really interesting to see that there is a Jewish community in Kentucky, that's not something that we really see or know. So which temple yeah, were you I was, part of? <laughs> I, well, I was kind of multicultural like that. Yeah. Uh, my family belonged to Adith Israel, which later became the temple. Yeah. Uh, but my grandparents belonged to Adith Jeshurun and Knesset Israel. And I'd spend the night on Friday nights and we would walk to whichever one of those had a bar mitzvah because there'd be better <laughs> food. So it was kind of a, an eclectic Jewish upbringing. I was raised by a village, as they say. We all were. And that place you went, the Jewish Community Center on yeah. Dutchman's Lane? Yeah. Every day. And I mean, every day, that's where we went. And during the summers, we just lived there. Nobody worried about how you're going to get home. People would always bring you, you it didn't matter. People would feed you. Uh, <laughs> it, it was really a Camelot era of Jewish community when I was a kid. So that, yeah, that place still has importance, significance, warm fuzzies for me because of the people I knew and still know at the Jewish Community Center. Well, focusing on your uh, composing and musicianship for a second here, a lot mm -hmm. of the themes that you did, they're not keyboard based from what we hear, but I guess you could tell that the orchestration was written elsewhere. Do you write everything on piano or keyboard or rather did you? Because I know you were retired. I used to do all my work even as I would. Here's the story. Uh, I worked for uh, several years as an orchestrator for other composers. And I would orchestrate the work. I would conduct the sessions and record stuff. And I was working for a guy named Dennis McCarthy, mm -hmm. who is a giant and a well, musical giant. Musical giant. And for whatever reason, Dennis came by my place to see how to pick up something or drop something off. And he saw me there working away at my draftsman table next to the piano. And he goes, no, what do you, come on, you don't need to play this stuff on a piano. You know, I've seen you on, on uh, recording stages away from a piano making intricate notes of it. He, he actually took my drafting table and moved it across the room to the other side. He says, sit here. That's where you sit to do the orchestrations. And it made perfect sense because the way I used to do it was, I'd play it on the piano and then I would write it down on the score sheet. And then I'd play it on the piano again to make sure I had it right. So it's three times to write something that I could have just 
written and moved on. Yeah. And in that way, I became more efficient. That was a long answer to your short question, Darren. <laughs> but from that moment on, no, I just went straight to paper. Or when recording technology evolved enough, I just went straight to recording stuff. If it needed to be written, for example, if it was for an orchestra or for, you know, horn section or singers, or whatever, of course, I, I write it out. But often I, just, I even skip that step. Hmm. Because if I think of a theme song like uh, Say by the Bell, the college years, not an over the top keyboard song, kind of a guitar that might have been a keyboard guitar sound right there. But no, that was a band and we, uh, you know, we sang it. I, what's weird is I still get checks from SAG AFTRA for having sang on Save by the Bell, the college years. Uh, no, I was not. You know, my origin story is as a pianist yeah. and a keyboard, a studio keyboardist. But when creating music for my clients, whatever was the necessary, you know, whatever did the job the best. And sometimes that was guitar or something. For piano, I kind of saved this trick that I'm a pianist. And when Will and Grace came about, piano became the primary voice for Will and Grace. Yeah. Not, you know, not in people later, folks like, well, you <laughs> would write things like, oh, well, of course, piano, you know, all the great gay icons who are pianists, Liberace and Elton John, or that, oh, piano, of course, it's the voice of, you know, gay cabaret. I, I don't know. None of that had anything to do with why it was piano. It was because of this. I knew these guys. David Max. I'd worked for them before. I'd done other series for them. And they, wonderful writers, nice people. And they were fiercely loyal to me. And I appreciate that. But they would call me from editing and say, look, we know we owe you a cut today of the show so you can do the music for it because we mix tomorrow. But we're really busy here. There's a lot of dialogue in this episode and we need more time in editing. Sorry, you're not getting a cut. And I would always say the same thing. It's all good, guys. I get paid the same. <laughs> Whether you give me two days or two minutes to do the job, it'll be there. The music will be great. Yeah. You get the mix. And they go, oh, we love you. And this would happen regularly. Yeah. So when Will and Grace began, and I started getting these thick scripts, you know, 40, 50 page scripts for a 22 minute episode, I'm going, guys, there's no chance that I'm ever getting a tape because so much dialogue you've written that needs to be cut. Is that fair to say? And they go, yeah, that, that's, that's fair. How about this? I play piano. Pretty good. How about if the sound of Will and Grace is piano and I'll do your show in real time. I can do a 20 minute episode in 22 minutes. Piano. And if there's time, I'll add percussion or stuff to it, but that'll be the sound of your show. The same way that the slap bass mm -hmm. is a signature for Seinfeld, yeah. piano will be the voice of Will and Grace. What do you say, guys? And they said, okay, that, that, that's fine. Won't it all kind of sound the same? I went, oh, no. You know, just like your four leading characters are each dynamic individuals, the music pieces within Will and Grace can each be dynamically charged. I mean, piano can be earthy like Elton John. It can be hip like Dave Grusin or cool yeah. like Chick Corea. It can be funny like Chico Marx. It can be flamboyant like Liberace. Piano can do all these things. Yeah. And it's, come on over guys. You got time? Come on over. Let's come up with a theme. And they came over. I improvised, I don't remember how many, seven or eight themes, recorded everything of course. Mm -hmm. And they picked one and that became the theme for Will and Grace. And that's only one of the many, many shows. I think you have 75 shows that you contributed to on just television alone without well, considering. Well, there, there were 75 shows, 75 shows for which I was the composer that I did all the episodes on. Uh, 44 of those shows, for 44 of them, I wrote the theme. Yes. I contributed to thousands of TV shows before I had earned 
the title of composer. Well, I was, yeah, that was kind of contributed. It's like, this is going to be too long of an interview. When I <laughs> first moved to LA, I was 17. I had really good skills. I had really good training. And the studios were happy to meet me because they treated me like a Swiss Army multi-purpose utility tool for musical chores. They knew that if they called me and said, we need this job, it needs doing, can you do it? It didn't matter if it remotely smelled like music, I would take that job. <laughs> so uh, in that way, I, I cemented a lot of relationships. And I got a lot of experience yeah. on lots and lots of TV shows. And it was all on the job training for what was to come next, my career as a composer. Totally get that. <laughs> a random thing about Seinfeld Actually, two quick questions about that theme. The first is, I've never heard this. My friend told me that there's an early version that had scat singing on there that they used in a few episodes. Is that true? True. Well, that just okay. right away. Here, 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 here's the story. Here's the deal. I'm gonna, you ask me a question, sometimes my answers will be too long, and you're welcome to throw the whole thing out. Um, never. The scat singing, I think it was the start of season two, or maybe season three. I forget, it's, it's, either, it's either 201 or 301. And I'm walking someplace with Jerry and Jerry says, you know, for the new season, maybe just some new sparkle, something change on the, the theme a little bit, just to acknowledge that we're moving forward. I went, yeah, okay. I, you know, the, I'm always evolving the sound anyway, but sure. And he said, you know, I heard, I've been listening to a lot of scat singing lately. Would that work with us? I went, well, I'll give it a try. So <laughs> I did it. I added some nonsense lyric scat singing. It's me and studio legend Angie Jure was the other singer. And we scat, scatted little thin lyrics sprinkled amongst the monologue and in the transitions. And it was a little weird. Remember, I had no great Jones to change the music for Seinfeld. Right. This is not my idea. But I'm always happy to serve, and Jerry's a very smart guy. Yeah. And even if I disagree with him on something, I know even at the moment that he's right. Same with Larry, because yeah. they're both really smart. Um, so I did it. I delivered it to the stage, to the dub stage. Jerry's there, Larry's there. They both said, wow, this is really weird. This is just so <laughs> weird and wacky and annoying and distracting. Okay, let's go with it. So <clears throat> I did the next two episodes using the scat singing. Angie and I created more of this stuff. So there's three episodes now with the scat singing on it. The first one finally aired. And all those NBC execs and Castle Rock execs mm -hmm. saw it for the first time. Obviously, they don't watch. They weren't watching their final mixed at the time. They would get tapes. Right. And Seinfeld wasn't very important. We weren't a hit show. We were kind of the ugly stepchild at the time. Right. And so they finally saw it online and went, "What the heck is that?" We weren't consulted about that and they rightly so were a bit miffed that Seinfeld had changed the music in such a dramatic way mm -hmm. and they said we don't like it take it out so it's just so the, so oh two and oh three I went back in retrofit with normal Seinfeld music but since oh one an episode called the note had already aired, we left the music in it. And it's still in it, in reruns and on the DVDs. That one episode has the weird scat singing. Well, I have to thank my friend Joe Hassan for giving me that question, to say the least. He, yeah. I'm doing an interview and I say, what's one or two things I can ask somebody that they definitely have not asked before? I, I say, Joe, what do you got? And that's what Joe fed me on that one. But that is in, that is inside baseball. Um, what's what's funny about it, this now I'm going to get even more inside. Uh, when 
Seinfeld was being packaged for a DVD. Yeah. And they wanted to create extra content, interviews and things. Uh, they came to my office and it was Glenn Padnick, who was my boss. He was head of TV for Castle Rock. Wonderful, sweet, brilliant man. Uh, and he's asking me all these questions for my interviews on the DVDs. And he asked about that. He says, really? talk about scat singing. And I had to tell the story, bearing in mind that the guy I'm speaking to is the guy who was offended that he wasn't consulted. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that was an interesting moment. But the good news is I considered Glenn a friend and he didn't mind me saying that he made me take him out. Other side of the Seinfeld composition thing, the early days of Napster, you know, in the 99, 2000 range, a lot of people were mislabeling songs. So anytime it was a song parody, people would say Weird Al Yankovic did it and it wasn't Weird Al. Anytime there was a slap bass thing, people would say Les Claypool from Primus did it. So there was a lot of <laughs> Seinfeld, that one. Les Claypool ones. So you were aware of all that. Oh yeah, I, would, I, would, <laughs> I didn't live in a cave. Um, yeah, I was aware that, uh, and it funny, it's funny, at one point I actually had contact with Les for some reason or another. And I said, you've heard this, right? And he goes, yeah, yeah, I've heard about this. And I said, well, just so you know, it would have been my honor. <laughs> well, to have Les Claypool play bass on Seinfeld. Of course. And it turns out it was it was me, but yeah. Yeah. You are funky. You are funky. So <laughs> I I don't know if it's public knowledge that you retired about 15 years ago. Is that something that you're okay with being out there? Oh yeah. It, 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 it's, it's been out there since the year 2000 when I announced it to both my people who worked for me and to my clients. Five years, people. We got five years before Wolf turns into a pumpkin. <laughs> and in 2005, with my wife and kids, we went into a Hollywood relocation witness protection program. Yeah. It's in Kentucky, who knew? And we left. And yes, during those five years, I continued doing more work and actually picked up some new shows. And when the time came, when it was 2005, I had strong hit shows, hit shows that were gonna continue on, but it was time for me to leave. And it was a little bit sad to say bye to shows like Reba. I loved working for Reba McIntyre. Yeah. Uh, but she understood and she wished me well. Same was true of Will and Grace. There was one more year of the original run of Will and Grace. But I had done so much piano music for Will and Grace. There was a library of about 2,500 individual pieces of music to use for transitions. They did not need me. Well, it was easy to do because I just would sit at the piano and lean my head over and music would fall out onto the keys. <laughs> that was one thing I loved about Will and Grace was I was able to, within the confines of it being on piano, anything goes. So I would improvise whatever I was feeling like for that scene every week. And often, usually, I would do more than one for each spot mm -hmm. so that my music editor, also a Jewish boy from Louisville, Kentucky, named Jack <laughs> Diamond, wow. um, Diamond, he, Jack, could have a choice on, this, on the stage in case, well, we don't really love that. Q, you got something else? He always would. So in that way, we had lots of spare parts that had never seen daylight. And so they, of course, hired Jack to stay with the show, even though I was retired. Mm -hmm. And he just used my library uh, to do transitions. And a guy who, I'd work, who had worked for me for many, many years, they wisely hired him to take over the special music portion of the composer job. Very few people in entertainment who say that they're going to retire actually do. Uh, there was the Kiss Farewell Tour in 2000, 2001, which is still going on. Cher's retirement tour was maybe 2002, 2003. You, 
actually did it. And you just said like, it was a little sad, but you knew that it was kind of time. Did you wind up taking up any new hobbies or trades or anything that's work-ish? You don't get 75 series by doing them one at a time. Right. I worked insanely long hours, Darren. Yeah. My regularly scheduled work week was well over 100 hours. And right. twice a year, way more than that, during pilot season and fall premieres. So I did not make it home a lot. Right. Doing that much work is really good for business. Yeah. But it's not great for your home life. My wife and I, we were having way too many kids. <laughs> and we agreed that they needed me more than Hollywood needed more of my music. Yeah. So in answer to your question, as soon as we landed in Kentucky, I became a full-time stay-at-home dad, PTA, room parent, sports coach, sports coach volunteer, uh, field trip chaperone, and that became my only focus for a long time. Well, I found you online because I always knew your name from being a person that reads credits and liner notes. I went, I'll ask that guy if he'll do an interview. And you amazingly wrote back quickly and positively. And I can't thank you enough for that. Well, you, you played the Jewish journal card. Uh, Jewish geography, Jewish journal, whatever it is that you want to call it there. And I didn't even know. So what were you doing in Louisville at the JCC? Uh, as a travel writer, I get flown out to different cities pre-COVID, of course, mm -hmm. where they go, can you come here and write a couple of articles about what uh, makes our city great? And uh, there was a great, uh, every September, although not this one, there's the three weekends of music festivals like Bourbon and Beyond and Louder Than Life. And I forget the name of the third one, the country. Before Castle. Yeah. And Before uh, Castle's in the summer, but yeah. Uh, Four Castle is another one. I've interviewed J.K. McKnight. Great guy. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming that you know him because if you know Gil Holland, you know a lot of people there. Uh, they brought me out that weekend, did some interviews, saw the Muhammad Ali Museum and all these great things and wrote about it. And they were, hey, you want to come back? Sure, I want to come back. Great city that I do hope to get back to. Uh, that's So some people don't know that the music writer also does travel, the travel writer also does food, the food writer also covers sports. And you like the, like the multi-purpose utility tool I mentioned earlier. Somebody's got to do it. So mm -hmm. when I was doing my research on you, I didn't really realize that you did lectures and appearances where you talked about your evolution. When did all that start? Well, remember when I, I said that I moved to Louisville to become a full-time dad? Right. That was in 2005, and you're probably good at math. Yeah. Those kids are grown. Yeah. They're, they don't need me 24-7, and at some point, they are all in college. And what's the room parent PTA in me supposed to do when I can't give out glue sticks and cupcakes in class? <laughs> I start giving college lectures. Yeah. So I was still volunteering at their schools, and it kind of exploded into a lot of universities. Um, last few years, mostly law schools mm -hmm. and music conservatories uh, clamor for me to come and blather at them. <laughs> so yes, I've been doing that for a couple of years now and it's, it's kind of fun like you, I get to travel, I get to see a lot of places and campuses Mm -hmm. for the most part, are beautiful places with smart people and energetic students and have to listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got the mic. Sit down. Um, <laughs> you put, that, put that phone down. Don't you fact check me because I yeah. said so. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I've been doing that. So, yeah, th th my list of schools where I've lectured includes every Ivy League school. Uh, most of the great law schools in the world have invited me to come and give lectures. 
Right. So yeah, it, it's, it's been a really fun time. COVID, of course, has either stopped or ended that. Right. It gave me a chance to do something once the kids were gone and didn't need me 24-7. And it also opened the door for me to do some professional public speaking, done a bunch of corporate events. And when I do those, I do that from the piano. I right. sit at the piano and I tell stories and uh, kind of like my Instagram videos, if you've checked those out. Mm -hmm. uh, my Instagram account for all you people paying attention is Seinfeld Music Guy. Right. And I, I'll sit at the piano and tell a story and it lasts a minute. And it's kind of fun. And I do that for corporate events. And I have done a bunch of uh, nonprofit fundraising concerts in that way. And it gives me a chance to volunteer, to give back. Mm -hmm. And that is how I volunteer. And I'm grateful to do it because it keeps me off of nonprofit boards and committees. <laughs> well, I was going to say two quick questions and then you're free. You actually just answered one of the two questions in there. So modifying this one a little bit, as a guy who's had all this success in television, do you like watching television or do you avoid television like the plague? For a few years after I retired, I just needed to decompress a little bit. Yeah. Uh, for a few years, I didn't play music. We didn't go to concerts. I didn't watch it. I just didn't. But now, my wife and I, we just about every night, we get into the gym. Uh, that was my big retirement gift for myself, was a really rocking gym. And we get into the gym, and we watch a couple of episodes of whatever we're binging at the time, and we get some work done in the gym. So, yeah, I watch it. A fair amount of TV now, all streaming, of course. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So, in I have no idea what's going on on the broadcast network schedules. The next time I interview, and hopefully there's the next time, then I'm going to pick your brain about the evolution of the theme songs and what you actually like on TV. So, being yeah, respectful you, of your time. That, 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 that's a Pandora's box. I, I, I will I I'll talk for hours on that. And sometimes, that is part of what I'm engaged to talk about is the value of theme songs and the monetary value and the fall of the dollar on it. Um, so yeah, I, I do like theme songs. I, I'm proud and happy that some of my work has become threaded into the fabric of American television life. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah, that, that does make me happy. And now that my kids are old enough, they know what I was doing all those nights when I wasn't home because they're familiar with some of those titles. I uh, learned yeah. the, the value of music real estate, AKA publishing. Yes, publishing royalties. And at the law schools, and that's mostly where I've been lecturing the last couple of years, I talk a lot about my view and my experience concerning in intellectual properties, copyright, contractual rights, publishing, licensing, royalties, how PROs work and how mm -hmm. consent decrees work with the performing rights organizations. So that is pretty much what I prattle on about at the law schools until Q&A. And then they just want to know what Larry David's like. <laughs> the word mechanicals, I'm sure, puts everyone to sleep. So <laughs> the closer. Yeah, the but mechanicals in the last couple of years has become a more important word as relates to streaming performances. The digital mechanicals and yeah. the performance rights of sound exchange and whatnot. And mm -hmm. here we are. <laughs> yeah, that, that, I'm the right guy for that interview. That's something else I do is... Uh, I'm brought in as a legal expert for rate court proceedings, trials, to talk about those kind of things. And I, although I am not involved in allocations concerning, you're probably talking about the Music Modernization Act. Yeah. Uh, I was involved in the drafts of that, but once it, was, once it passed, I have not had anything to do with it. 
Uh, but I'm hopeful that over time, creators and copyright holders can be fairly compensated for their properties. No three quarter rate for you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's important. Uh, it's important for a lot of reasons. And also I go occasionally, I will lobby. Yeah. Uh, organizations have brought me into lobby. I've gone to Washington to talk to folks about the importance of defending U.S. copyrights. And it is important. Once upon a time, Darren, uh, if a skyscraper was to be built anywhere in the world, that steel came from Pennsylvania. Right. It's and, and, it used to. Uh, that's no longer true. Yeah, and Brazil, at one point in the world, if you wanted a manufactured car, that car came from Michigan. Yes. That's no longer true. We enjoyed, and there's a, it's a long list of things like that, where we enjoyed an overwhelmingly lopsided trade imbalance in our favor. And somehow, some way, we've let that go. Uh, music and entertainment in general still today represents the same kind of overwhelmingly lopsided trade imbalance in our favor. We create the world's entertainment mm -hmm. and it does not require cargo ships to move or longshoremen to unload. It's just digital product out and money in. Yeah. And if we say it's okay for even U.S. companies, Google, Apple, to build business models based on exploiting these U.S. copyrights without fair compensation. If we say that's okay, if our lawmakers put it out there, it's okay to do that, then it's not the fault of our overseas friends if they are predisposed to agree with us on that. So for that reason, you're a writer, you create intellectual property also. Yes. If we put it out there that it's okay to just take that and use it and make money off of it without paying us for it. Yeah. We are the same way that steel now comes from wherever it comes from, China, Brazil. Russia. Yeah. Wherever it comes from and cars, <laughs> not here. Um, entertainment will be the same thing and we will lose out on this great American tradition of this is where great movies come from and great music comes from. I know for myself, if there wasn't a mechanism in place to make money as a musician, I would have done something different. And that is certainly true of the next generation of artists, musicians, writers, creators. Right. If they don't see a path for a career where they can make money. The greatest minds will not have entered the field. That is correct. We, the, yes. the, it won't be a brain drain. It'll, be, it'll, it'll just be poof, they're gone. They're doing something else. And I think uh, we as Americans and the world in general will be less funny and less happy and less entertained because of that. I know, you didn't ask. I'm just, now I'm just, you know, going on like a an addled old man talking about the glory days no you're not uh shaking your fist at the clouds you're not doing that you just <laughs> said very insightful stuff that hopefully people will pick up on that they need to in all the things that they're protesting they need to protest how spotify and comparable streaming sites are are compensating the writers the union musicians and the performers rather than just giving equity stakes to major labels in exchange for the catalogs and then not passing that along to the actual content creators. I, boy, I will certainly endorse that statement, Darren. Yeah. Well, hopefully they don't make it this far into the interview and drop the podcast from Spotify. So <laughs> on that, well, right, I, right. I, I, by the way, I'm aware that this is a whole lot less fun than tell me about, tell me a Larry David story. <laughs> I didn't want to do that to you. I, I think that anybody, my goal is somebody watches this and goes, wait, that's the guy who did this, 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 and this that I love? Let me see what else he's done. And then they go down the rabbit hole and then they find that Larry David story. Yeah, just like the Les Claypool 
Yes. And that falsehood, there's plenty. I just yesterday, uh, someone else, I, I do not expect you to run this past me before you uh, put it out there, but uh, someone did send me before she launched her article and it included untrue internet facts Ooh. about me. It, I don't know where it came from, but there's this thing, my list often includes the theme for Matt about you. Which, which was Andrew not, Gold. I did not write Andrew, I don't, that does not sound, that's, thank you for being a friend. Uh, Andrew Gold did that, for which Golden Girls used, and uh, then he uh, did the Mad About He didn't Mad About I did not even know that, good for him. But just to clarify, it was not me. Uh, but even just yesterday that came up to, 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 so it's funny how these things that are not true. So when your, your, uh, listeners and viewers go down that rabbit hole to look at the things I've done, don't believe everything you read. Well, actually one quick thing and then you're free. Any Fred Stoller <laughs> stories? Fred, who is an absolute pro, by the way. Yes. He, he knows what he's hired to do. He's a funny man. He brings the funny. He's, his physical comedy is so perfect and subtle. Um, and so he has guested, I don't know how many of my shows, 15, 20, who knows? Because he's always in there at some point. Yes. Uh, so he and I sort of got used to seeing each other and kind of struck up a weird friendship. Uh, okay, I'll see you on the next show. <laughs> um, and so I do not have any weird stories about Fred, uh, just that he is very good at what he does. He comes, he delivers, and he delivered on Seinfeld. Same yeah. way I thought he, I thought that character was wonderful and brilliant. Um, he's not really a leading man type, but then again, neither am I. So maybe <laughs> that's why I... I'm fascinated by his career, and I hope he has many more successes, and wouldn't it be funny if someday he becomes a leading man? Fred and Vinny was a pretty good movie. Uh, hopefully mm -hmm. there's Fred and Vinny too, although I don't think that's very possible, but Jonathan- well, you're, the one, you're the one who said that, okay. <laughs> <laughs>